Let's open to the second to the last book of the Old Testament. The prophet Zechariah, it's the 38th book of the Old Testament, or just go to the new and back up from Matthew back to the, through Malachi to Zechariah. The 12th chapter. This morning, there's one city, there's one place, there's one word that God said, if you always keep your eye on that place, then you'll always know what I'm doing in this world. The holy, holy God we just sang about. God has, has set one place as his place. He calls it my city. He calls it the place where I dwell. He said, this place belongs to me. He said, the nations try and divide it and take it. But he said, always keep your eye on one place. And that place is the city of Jerusalem. And this morning, I would like to share with you from the book of Zechariah, chapter 12 and verse 3, that, that we should especially, as we're continuing, remember where we are, this is the third week, we're looking at the biblical doctrine of inspiration, and there are seven reasons why every born-again believer should trust the Bible as inspired and authoritative. The first of the seven reasons is because only the Bible, of all the religious books of the world, of all the world religions, only the Bible dares to have prophecy. And prophecy is detailed descriptions of the future that are given in the past that are verifiable and they're not fuzzy and murky. They're actually verifiable, factual descriptions of future events that only God does. And and here's an example. In chapter 12, in fact, the whole 12th chapter of Zechariah through the 14th is one of the most fascinating prophetic passages of Scripture. And in the third uh, verse, the Lord says this, and it shall happen in that day. And what day is it? Uh, It's the the time when the end days at verse uh, 1 and 2 talk about when the whole world is getting upset and and focusing on Jerusalem. It'll happen in that day, uh, a future day in the last day, that I... The Lord says, we'll make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all people, and all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Now, when Zechariah wrote those words, it must have been the hardest thing for him to write on paper. Zechariah, in fact, uh, often about every year I, I stand in his tomb and look at Jerusalem. His tomb is on the Mount of Olives and you see Jerusalem. But when Zechariah was looking at Jerusalem, he probably was on the Mount of Olives because Jerusalem had been uh, completely uh, destroyed by the Babylonians and the rocks were blackened and, and tumbled and the walls were all down and the temple was raised and there was really nothing there. It was just a mess, a heap of rubble. And he's writing and he's saying, and he knows who's talking, God. And God says, I'm going to make that blackened pile of rubble a heavy stone for all people. And then when he was writing the end of that verse, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it, Jerusalem, at 3,000 feet in elevation, not near any major road, not near any major highway, it's not near any major river, it's just kind of out there, you know, on top of a hill, very, there's no natural resource, there's nothing really interesting about, it's just there. And he is writing, all the world is going to come here? Huh, I'm glad God knows what he's doing. Well, if you think about it, when Jesus told his disciples about the future, Jesus built every word. Remember, I told you this, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Jesus preached three uh, versions of a wonderful sermon on the future. Every word of his sermon, he built it all, the future of the earth, about, around that one spot, Jerusalem. He says his second coming is tied to Jerusalem. Jesus said, keep your eye on Jerusalem. I'm ascending from the Mount of Olives. That's the center of Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is is the center of the hills of Jerusalem. He says, I am returning to the Mount of Olives. And according to the Lord, the center of the world and the history of the world revolves around Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't to us. To us, the world's history has revolved around Rome for a while, and it it revolved around London for a while, when the British Empire was the mistress of the seas, and and the sun never set upon it. And right now, briefly, the world centers around Washington, and and in the future, it's going to center around other places. But you know what? To God, the world centers around Jerusalem, the history of this world. 
The most mentioned place in the Bible is a city called Jerusalem. Jerusalem should be your favorite city because it's God's. Did you know that in First Corinthians or First Kings chapter eleven, in verse thirteen, uh, God says this. He says, "For the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen, I will not separate it from the house of David." God says, "My chosen place, my favorite place. You might have one. I, I've heard that it gets wintry here and dark sometime in the year. I haven't seen it yet because it's raining too much. But sometime it gets <laughs> wintry and dark." There, you laughed. I can tell my funny story. Yesterday, I was, <laughs> I was in an elevator in Denver. I was, uh, a friend of mine called uh, a few weeks ago, and, and Mike Gendron from Proclaiming the Gospel, and he says, I can't go and speak at this conference. Would you please, you're a friend, go? And I said, I said, no, I don't want to, but I will because you're a friend. And so I agreed, and I flew in and out of Denver through the hurricane. And so I was in this, this huge hotel in Denver, and there's this huge conference there, and people were standing in the elevator, and they all had their little conference brochures, you know, uh, the, the people that come to this conference. And they're looking over, and I was rushing because I had to speak at 9 o'clock, and it was 8 o'clock, and I had to go set up and everything. And someone said, who is that at 9 o'clock? Oh, don't know him. I'm not going. Here I'm in the elevator with him. <laughs> And I didn't say a word, and, uh, and it got to the conference, and, um, and it was a blessing. But then, this morning, I got here, and by the way, we were delayed, and all of our flights, and everything was canceled, and we got to Dallas, and we were there late last night, and finally, they find a flight to Detroit, and we got to Detroit in the monsoons last night. Our car is here at the Kalamazoo Airport. Doesn't everybody fly out of Kalamazoo? We landed in Detroit at 10 o'clock at night in the rain. So I'm in this little tiny rental car driving, and you can't drive very fast because there's so much water on 94 that never seems to be finished being repaired, and they need to put drains on it. And so here we're driving along, so I finally, and I'm here this morning, and I'm in the lobby shaking hands with people, and they look at me and they say, why do you have that thing on your face? I said, I said it's just a microphone. They said, well, who are you? Well, I had already asked them. I, I mean, I thought they'd been here 30 years. I wrote them in the back of my Bible, and it was their first Sunday. And so uh, I felt like I was in an elevator in Denver. I'm glad they stayed for the service. <laughs> so, so, but back, back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city that God says, keep your eye on it. Now, why am I even saying that? Because this week, I told you that, that when, when you start seeing things that are mentioned in the Bible, coalescing and coming together, you know something's going to happen. And I told you about keep your eye on that four-letter word, Iran. Do you know what happened this week? Iran converged with Jerusalem, and the president of Iran said, I am going to keep up my resistance and my attack until Jerusalem is liberated from the Jews. Now that's really interesting stuff. Because that comes right into what God says. Jerusalem is God's timepiece. The final events of world history will culminate at Jerusalem with the glorious return of Jesus Christ. Mentioned over 800 times in God's word, Jerusalem is an important place. But this week, Jerusalem came alongside of Iran. We already know that God has told us, not the United Nations and not the strategic central command of the Pentagon, but God said, that there is in a future time going to be an invasion to liberate Jerusalem coming from the north. And the, the leader of the band is going to be Iran, and they're going to be allied with Russia. Now, I'm, I, you know, I'm not blowing smoke. The Bible says that. But what's amazing is when you're reading that in the New York Times and the USA Today and Bloomberg Report, and when they say, The Iranians are serious about this. They're spending most of their domestic, gross domestic product on developing as many weapon systems as they can. They're getting indigenous in their submarine warfare and their ballistic missile and they're making drones. They're doing anything they can with one goal. Do you know what the goal of Iran is? To annihilate Israel. That should get our attention. Because if you look at God's radar screen, and now I want you to turn with me, to Ezekiel. Now, if you're in Zechariah, just keep backing up, okay? It's not very far. Ezekiel, we're going to look at Ezekiel 36 to 39 this morning. Because this week, Iran stated their total dedication was to give strategic depth to the jihad to liberate Jerusalem. Let me show you Iran doing what they said. I don't know when they're going to do it. It could be a thousand years from now. Hard to believe. Could be a hundred years from now. Hard to believe that, too. 
But it could be any time. But this is what the Bible, starting in Ezekiel 36, and it builds up to it, it tells us that Israel is going to be attacked. But let me give you a little history. Israel has not controlled Jerusalem until recently. Think about this. Babylon, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, handwriting on the wall, lion's den, fiery furnace, Babylon. Okay, that's Old Testament, book of Daniel. Babylon took over Jerusalem 2,600 years ago. It's a long time, 26 centuries ago. We are so myopic, we think about just now. But just think back, 2,600 years. Most people don't like history, but just at least do the math. That's a long time ago. 2,600 years ago, Babylon wrestled Jerusalem from Israel. Persia, the empire, the Medo-Persian empire, Medo-Persian, you ever heard of the Medes, Darius the Mede? Do you know how you say Medes in 2008? That's Kurdistan. It's the same people. I was just speaking at uh, the seminary in Amman, the Jordanian Evangelical Theological Seminary, and I was meeting the students like I meet you here, and I was shaking hands, and I said, hello, and what's your name? He says, my name is Barbar, and I said, where are you from? He says, I'm a, a Median. I'm a Mede. I said, you mean like in the Bible? He says, yeah. He says, I'm a Mede. I said, wow. And I, I shook the next hand, I asked this guy, he says, and what's your name? And he told me his name. He says, and I'm Babylonian. I said, what do you mean Babylonian? He says, I live in Babylon. In Iraq. I went, you guys still... The next guy was an Assyrian. I thought we had a time warp. Did you know all those places are still here and the people still identify in those ethnic groupings? There are still all these different people. And that happened 2,500 years ago when the Persian Median Empire took over Jerusalem. They held it just for about 200 years and then the Greeks took it. Remember Alexander the Great? 2,200 years ago, Jerusalem went from the control of the, the Medo-Persians to the Greeks and then Rome took it. You know, Rome, the emperors, the Caesars. 2,100 years ago, Rome took over Jerusalem and, and the, the great General Pompey took over and he got that city and he, it became under Rome and they, they started working on building it. Then the Muslims got it 1,300 years ago. They beat out the Romans. And, and if you know anything about the whole conflict back then, you know, the Byzantine Empire, and it finally fell, and the Muslims 1,300 years ago at Jerusalem. And then the Ottoman Turks, at the same time as Martin Luther, 500 years ago, the Ottoman Turks, the people of Turkey, the Ottomans, they're kind of Asiatic people that migrated down there, became Muslims, and they took over the whole Jerusalem area in 1512, 500 years ago. You say, well, what's the history lesson for? Well, Then 90 years ago, the British took over Palestine. But 40 short years ago, God allowed Israel to once again have Jerusalem as their capital for the first time in 2,600 years. So this, what we're reading about in in Zechariah and Ezekiel, could not have happened for 2,600 years because there was no Jerusalem for a coalition of nations to come against that belonged to Israel until 40 years ago. In 1967, you remember the great Six-Day War? And Israel began kissing the ground of the Temple Mount. They had actually taken the city of Jerusalem. And that caused a lot of angst around the world. Because God allowed Israel once again to have Jerusalem as their very own capital. And then a series of events, God's word describes, surrounding a group of nations seeking to attack Israel and liberate Jerusalem, written 2,600 years ago, they all of a sudden are no longer fuzzy. Now we have Ezekiel possible. It wasn't possible since Ezekiel wrote it. When Ezekiel wrote this, the Babylonians were encamped around taking Jerusalem. When Ezekiel got done writing this, there was no Jerusalem that needed to be taken. It was gone. And yet he predicted that in a future day, far away, it's called in the distant future, Jerusalem would be surrounded by nations trying to take it away from Israel. The series of events in God's word described surrounding that group of nations, written in detail 2,600 years ago, has gone from murkiness and fuzziness to clarity. Well, let's just walk through Ezekiel 36. If you're there in your Bible, probably my favorite verse in the whole 36 uh, chapter is 26 and 27. You'll hear me say this often at communion. It's a good verse to memorize. This is the new covenant. I will give you, Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You'll keep my commandments and do them. That's the new covenant. 
By the way, the new covenant was made, first of all, with Israel. And this is a future event when Israel is going to get a new heart, a new spirit. They don't have it now. They're very secular, very pagan. They think they're winning the war themselves. But in the midst of this description of what God's going to do in the future, he brought up this great new covenant promise, which is what the New Testament writers began describing is what happens in us when we're saved. We get a new heart. In fact, this morning, if you're a born-again believer, you've had a heart transplant. You want to shock someone if you're younger? Uh, you know, talk to a group of people, and, and uh, they're all talking about their knee transplants, you know, and their hip transplants and everything. You say, I've had a heart transplant. Especially if you look like you're in your 20s or something. They'll look at you and say, what? You say, oh, yeah, I have a heart transplant. They said, what is that? Look at verse 26. A new heart also I'll give you, a new spirit I'll put within you. And you can explain to them that the only way to have peace and joy and everlasting life and, and to have tranquility in your life is to get a heart transplant. That's what God does. The new birth is not joining a church or getting baptized or you know, repeating a prayer after me. It's when God gives you a new operating system. When he reaches in and takes out the old stony, as it's talking about in 26 and 27, and puts a brand new operating system in us. We are brand new from the core of our being. We have a brand new orientation in life and spiritual life. But that's the 36th chapter. But surrounding all that is something else. Let me just walk through it with you. Ezekiel 36 pictures the exiled Israelites scattered around like a pile of bones. By the time we get to chapter 37, look what it says there. And the Lord came upon me and brought me by the spirit to a valley, and he saw this valley of dry bones. So in chapter 36 is the run-up to the pile of bones in 37. And, and 36 talks about it because of their disobedience and sin and because of their idolatry. God causes judgment, promised judgment, from the Pentateuch to fall on Israel. So by the time we get to 37, there's this dry and dead pile of bones in this desert valley. It's almost like an old western, you know, you can imagine Death Valley and a pile of steer heads, you know, and that's what it looks like, that's what I see in my mind. That's how God looked at Israel. And then chapter 37 describes the call of God that begins to stir and draw Jews from all over the world. And, and what it says is that, that all of a sudden these bones start, start coming together. They're, 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 instead of being scattered over the whole valley, they're starting to coalesce and, and join and merge. And all of a sudden the skeletons form into human skeletons. It's just a very kind of Halloween picture, I guess. But what really is happening is that's describing the events that began in the late 19th century. Jews began migrating to the area now called Israel. By the mid-20th century, they became a recognized nation called Israel. So uh, chapter 37 actually has happened in some of your lifetimes, and, and it's in recent history for the rest of us. This happened in 1948, that, they, that the bones came together, and there, there was this nation of Israel. Then, uh, you know that what happened, 48 uh, started Israel, 56 was the great war where all the Arabs decided they were going to get rid of them after eight years, then 67 was the next great war, 11 years later, and all of, of the world watched as they thought Israel was going to be annihilated, and Israel defeated the combined armies of all those nations. This is all history. But look at chapter 38, because directly following this description, of this, this nation of Israel. All of a sudden we have Ezekiel 38. It follows the description of this return of the nation of Israel to, to becoming a country. And in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's a war described by God through Ezekiel's eyes that features armies coming from what we would describe as an Islamic coalition. Now remember this, Ezekiel is talking from the, con from the context of 2,600 years ago. So he's going to describe places that were geographically recognizable 2,600 years ago. And if you get an old map, just find a, a map that describes what the world was like pre-Rome uh, and pre-the you know the modern times, and look back at the ancient world, and what you'll find is Ezekiel is picking, picking out geographic sites that are still identifiable on the map. And if you look at that, today, those geogra see what's neat about the Bible is it takes a place from then to identify a geographic location. If you overlay today's geopolitical map over it, you find that everywhere Ezekiel describes would be an Islamic nation or Russia. 
Every one of them. So we call it an Islamic confederation allied with what today we call Russia. But back then they were the Scythians and there are a lot of other words in there. This event is described, uh, this, this war starting in chapter 38, look what it says, Ezekiel 38, 1, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, so we know this is going to happen because God's saying it, the word of the Lord. That's code for God says. And if God says it's going to happen, son of man, verse two, set your face against Gog in the land of Magog and the prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal, the prophesy against him. And thus says the Lord, and he keeps going down and look at verse five. This is what I keep talking about. The, the leader of the, the band, verse five, Persia, that's Iran. They're the start of this list that's coming against Israel. So basically, 38 and 39 describe a massive attack launched against whatever the nation is in 36 and 37. 36 and 37 clearly describes Israel. 38 and 39 clearly describes Israel being attacked from without by what we would say in the 21st century, an Islamic coalition. So the first question we have is when would this happen to be? And so you do a Bible study. Over the years, various Bible teachers have looked. Look at, look at what it says in verse 2, Gog and Magog. So obviously there are two unusual words you can search in the Bible. And what you find is that there are three times Gog and Magog occur in the Bible. So we have to identify when exactly would this chapter 38 happen. The first place that Gog and Magog show up in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 19. And 19, 11 through 21 say that Gog and Magog come up in a battle called Armageddon. But the interesting thing is that Armageddon is seen to be at the end of the seven-year time of trouble that's called the tribulation. And when, when this, the battle of Gog and Magog and Armageddon ends, the world as we know it ends. There's no seven years of, if, if you read Ezekiel 38, after this war, they're cleaning up for seven years after the war of chapter 38 and 39. They're burying people for seven months. There's so many people that are killed in this war, it takes seven months to build massive graves and get all the bodies in it and cover them up. And then it says it takes them seven years of reclaiming all the stuff from the battlefield and using it. They're actually burning it and, and using the war gear. So this can't be Revelation 19, 11 through 21. This could not. Ezekiel 38 cannot be the battle of Armageddon. If it is, then, then God is, is making a conflict there. And so what we know is that the Bible never conflicts itself. And so if you look at, it, at Revelation 19, 11 to 21, the battle of Armageddon, you see it clearly ends with Jesus Christ coming in the clouds at the head of the heavenly armies as the king of kings and lord of lords and he says enough is enough and he just ends it all and sets up his kingdom so we know it's not then what's the other time Gog and Magog show up well it's just the next chapter in Revelation 20 7 through 9 and Ezekiel is not describing that Gog and Magog because that Gog and Magog is at the end of what we call the millennium now, the word millennium is never in the Bible, but the number seven times of 1,000 years is. And the Bible describes a period of time 1,000 years long seven times in Revelation 20. We call it the millennium. Uh, that's just the Latin word for a 1,000. And so uh, the Greek word is kilial, kilialis. We're called kilios because we believe in the 1,000-year reign. But that thousand year reign is ended. If you look in Revelation 20 and verse 7, you don't have to right now, but write it down. It ends with Satan being released from prison. He's in prison for a thousand years. And he goes out and stirs up all the nations to come against Jerusalem again. And all the nations of the earth converge. And God just says, we're not even going to have a battle. And it says he just, he just destroys them all. And that's when we go right into the great white throne judgment. So obviously, Ezekiel 38, back to where we are, cannot be the battle of Armageddon because of the seven-year cleanup afterward. It cannot be after the millennium because, again, there's no cleanup afterward. It's the great white throne. So this is a third Gog and Magog battle. The final one is at the end of the millennium. The middle one is at the end of the tribulation. When is this one? We don't know. And increasingly, biblical scholars are saying that Ezekiel 38 and 39 could happen at any time. Now think, that is a sobering thought. Especially when you have what's going on right now around the world. 
Well, let's go into some of the details. Walk with me through uh, chapter 37. I want to show you starting in verse 18. Uh, The first thing we see that identifies what's going on here uh, to identify when exactly this battle is, we find that a united Israel is attacked. It says in Ezekiel 37, 18, it says, and the children of your people come and speak, will you not show me what you mean? Verse uh, 17, join them one to another for you yourself are one stick, Ezekiel 37, 17. What is this? Well, if you read 15, 16, and 17, you know that Israel was a divided nation. You remember King Saul was the first king, King David was the second king, David's son Solomon was the third king, and he reigned over the 12 tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, but his son Rehoboam was a rascal, Solomon's son. And the elders said, your dad was tough on us, a lot of taxes and stuff. What are you going to do? And he said, give me three days. And he came back and he says, my dad's legs are going to be like my little finger. I'm going to be so tough on you. You're going to pay more taxes than you ever paid in your life. And the people rebelled and split in two. And the northern half of Israel became known as Israel. The southern half became known as Judah. And that's where Yehuda, Jews, that whole concept comes from. Judeans, the southern, they were loyal to the Lord and Jerusalem and all and the worship of God. The northern kingdom had a series of kings and they went off worshiping calves and idols and everything else. And the nation in 931 BC split in half. So Israel has not been united as one nation since Solomon's son, a thousand years BC. So 3,000 years, Israel hasn't been united. But look what it says in 37 from 15 down through uh, 18 and 19. It says that this stick is going to be joined together. And basically, to a Jew, what that meant is the northern kingdom, Manasseh and Ephraim, and the southern kingdom, Judah, are going to be united in one nation. Did you know when that happened? In 1948. Israel became a united... It isn't two parts anymore. They don't have northern Israel and southern Israel. They have Israel. It's one nation. So the first thing that that tells us when the battle of Gog and Magog is going to be, it's going to be a united Israel. Look at Ezekiel 38.8. Secondly, it's going to be a secure Israel. In Ezekiel 38 and verse 8, it says, After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land, brought back to the word, and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel who had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them, look at the end of verse 8, dwell safely. A secure Israel. You know, Israel has one of the most advanced security systems. They have 200 and some million Arabs seeking to annihilate them, and they have very few incidents. There's so few that we hear about all of them. Did you know that that it is unbelievable the level of security they have? The level of of, uh, surveillance and electronic stuff. They are advanced. They are very secure in all their stuff. Well, the only thing the Bible says is it's going to be a secure Israel when this comes, that they're going to feel like they have the security thing. Look at at verse um, 8 of chapter 38 also. Another thing it says in that verse, it says, uh, after many days you will be visited in the latter years, you will come into the land. It's also a prophetic Israel. It's not only secure uh, Israel and not only uh, united Israel, it's a prophetic, it's a future Israel. See, when Ezekiel wrote this, he says, you notice what verse 8 starts with, after many days. Some people try and put 38, Ezekiel 38 into the past. They say, well, this happened in Daniel's time or this happened you know, in Malachi's time. No, it says after many days when Israel is back dwelling in a land secure. Another thing is it's going to be a hated Israel. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 of chapter 38, it says to take plunder. Why are these people marching on Israel? Why is this Gog and Magog thing coming? It's because there's going to be a growing number of people who hate Israel. If you read the news, 90% of all the United Nations resolutions, do you know what 90% of all the United Nations business has involved for the last 60 years? Resolutions against what group of people? One of the smallest nations on earth. Postage stamp size, Israel. Most of the United Nations stuff is against Israel. You just add up the resolutions that have been made in the United Nations. It's like the whole world hates them. It's a hated Israel. But look at at chapter 39. Here's another thing that's going to be uh, about this. 39 and verse 12 of Ezekiel. 
When the Gog and Magog battle happens, it says that this is going to be a protected Israel because Israel's attacked, and it's not Israel's atomic bombs that, that wins. You see, they don't really have enough stuff to stop what's going to come against them. If you get the Russians and the Iranians and all the United Muslim people coming against Israel, they don't really have enough stuff without destroying themselves to stop it all. And so what it says in 39.12 is, if you look at the words, it says, for seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. God stops them. If you read 39 and the end of 38, God supernaturally sends earthquakes and fires. That's what the Bible says. Finally, it's a deceived Israel because Israel thinks that they do it themselves. Well, basically, I want to tell you that so much has happened so fast that just to summarize this so you can remember, Ezekiel 36 and 37 talk about the return of Israel as a nation. They were divided in 931 B.C. They were conquered from 586 B.C. For 2,600 years, they've been without sovereignty. In 1948, they became a sovereign nation. In 1967, they got Jerusalem. That started a countdown. Because it it said in Zechariah 12 and verse 3 that all of the world is going to be fixated on Jerusalem. There are more news reporters in Jerusalem than anywhere except Washington, D.C. There is more news coverage about Jerusalem and the Palestinian issue and the the partition wall and all of the the Arab-Israeli conflict. More than any other issue in the world, that is covered in the news. Why? Why? Because God said in Zechariah 12 and verse 3, Jerusalem is going to become a heavy stone for the whole world. In terms of recorded history, so much has happened so fast that we need to pause and look at the big picture of what I just read to you. These chapters are remarkable now because they all happened in the last 60 years. You understand, everything I just said about the return of Israel just happened in the last 60 years. And yet for 2,600 years since Ezekiel penned them, there was no regathered nation. There was no Israel to be a target of an Islamic coalition. Century after century of Bible teachers looked at these two chapters and they said they're so remote, they're so vague, they are impossible that they will ever happen until 60 years ago. And they happened. And they continue to unfold before our eyes When Ezekiel's bones of 36 and 37 grew into a living, breathing nation, 50 plus years passed and no one seemed to join into this coalition until about 10 years ago. And all of a sudden the drumbeat of Russia and Iran started. It really wasn't last week or last month. It actually started about 10 years ago. And God described in detail what would happen And every time God has declared what will happen, it happens. It happens literally just like he said. So what should we have as a lesson this morning from a little history we just went? Number one, for those of you that take notes, you want to write something down? Here's the first thing to write down. Trust the God who sees Israel as a nation in the last days. Only God could predict that Israel would become a united nation 2,600 years in the future. When Ezekiel wrote down what he wrote down, he said there's going to be united, both houses of Israel are going to be united into one nation, and they are going to be a sovereign nation in the future that's going to be attacked by all the nations of the world. Trust the God that saw that 2,600 years in the future. Nobody else ever would have predicted that would happen. Ezekiel 36 and 37 tell us. Start at, look at, at chapter 36, verse 10 of Ezekiel. This is what God says. I will multiply men upon you. This is the land. All the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. The return of the Jews to the Holy Land after centuries of exile is predicted. You probably don't even know how serious the exile was. When the Romans, when the Romans got fed up with the Jews in AD 70, they not only killed a million of them, in the city of Jerusalem and they butchered them and they put them on crosses and thousands of people and they just, they starved them and then they crucified them. The Romans were so angry at the rebellion that they just, they did the first Holocaust. They just, just really were very angry in the destruction of Jerusalem. But they didn't stop there. They banned Jews from being in the land. They said, you may no longer live here. You get out And the Roman Empire pushed them out of what is called Palestine today, the nation of Israel, and they pushed them to the furthest reaches of the empire. Now, few of them stayed, but most of them left. 
What Ezekiel says is, look at chapter 37 and verse 12. Therefore, I prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. What happened in 1945? The, the liberation, uh, VE day, you know, the victory in Europe day, and the whole opening up of the Holocaust crematoriums and everything and all the death camps. And what happened is people started looking like walking skeletons. This literally happened 3712. I opened up your graves. Have you ever seen the picture of when they opened up those, those death camps and those emaciated, rag covered Jews began walk, they looked like walking skeletons. And where did they walk to? They walked, were drawn by the millions to Israel, the one spot they could call their own. And when they got there, they they began to do something. They began, look at chapter 36, 36. Ezekiel 36, 36. The nations which are left around you will know that I, the Lord, I have rebuilt the ruined places. Do you know what those early settlers did when they left the Holocaust death camps? Do you know what they did? They went back and they moved to biblical cities. They moved to Beth El. They moved to Gibeon. They moved to, and they started naming these cities after what they were called in the Bible. God says in Ezekiel 36, you're going to rebuild the ruined places. You're going to rebuild the cities that are mentioned in the Bible, and they did it. Did God make the early settlers name their cities after biblical sites? No. They wanted to tie themselves to the Bible. They wanted to tie themselves to the past. They... In fact, I I love going over to Israel. When you go there, you'll find there's people from over 100 different countries. They're all Jews. They have one unity. They're Jews, but they come from 100 different countries. And when you ask the average Jew on the street, what are you doing here? They all say, I want to be here. It's hard. I don't know why I left my home, but I just want to be here. That's God pulling them back. Our guide that that we've used for 15 years, his father was the district uh, judge in New Jersey, had a big, big position, lots of money. His son was a, a musician and making lots of money, and he's a Jew, And he was at the height of his career in the late 70s. And all of a sudden, he just put his guitar down in New Jersey and he went and moved to a kibbutz, picking carrots. And I said, Elliot, what do you do that for? He said, I don't know. He said, I was making so much money and having so much fun in Jersey. And he said, I just felt compelled to come back here. And you know what he did? He bought a, a little property, and he lives in, in, on the hillside overlooking Bethlehem. And he, every time I visit him, he takes me out, and he says, look at that. He said, that's the Bible. He said, everywhere I look, I see things from the Bible. He's not a Christian. He's not a believer. He doesn't believe the Bible like we do. But yet, he is drawn there because God drew him back. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 8 and 9. Uh, trust the God who said they will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will come back to the land, and they will cause the land to bloom like a rose. Look what it says in verse 8. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. Verse 9. For indeed I am for you, I will turn you, and you shall be tilled and sown. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, do you know what else they did? They cut down every tree. They used it in the siege ramps. And then when the Ottomans came in, after a few centuries, they further the desolation of Israel, and they taxed every person that lived in the land and said, you're paying tax for every tree you have on your property. If you were charged tax for every tree on your property and you didn't have much money, what would you do to your trees? Yeah, cut them all down. So Israel was totally deforested. For 500 years, the Romans started it and the Ottoman Turks continued it to the end. Today, if you go to Israel, any trees you see were planted recently because the land became so desolate, it just looked like Death Valley. When Mark Twain went there in the 19th century, he said, this is the most God-forsaken swamp of a, and he used a lot of other coarse words. It was nothing. You know what God says? Look at 8 and 9. I'm going to cause you to be tilled and sown. I'm going to, verse 30, look at Ezekiel 36 and verse 30. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and increase your fields. Okay, in 1920, Israel had no tillable, arable land. It was just swamps and malaria and nothing. Today, the prime supplier of fruit 
and flowers to Europe is Israel. They sell billions and billions and billions of dollars of fruit and flowers. Why? Because God says, I will multiply, verse 30, the fruit of your trees, and I will enable you to dwell, and the ruins will be rebuilt. Verse 34, the desolate land shall be tilled. Verse 35, the land that was desolate will become like the Garden of Eden. That's the modern agricultural miracle of Israel. Did those agricultural engineers, irrigation pioneers, and desert scientists devote their lives to Israel and its wasteland condition just to make Ezekiel come true? They have perfected the art of drip irrigation. We in America are starting to use Israeli techniques. The world is finding as water supplies decrease that if Israeli engineering techniques are used, you can cause incredible crop yields with just drips of water. Do you think all those scientists figured that out because they wanted Ezekiel to come true? No. They probably never heard of Ezekiel. God was doing it. Because he said, I want you to know that I'm the God you can trust because I promised that Israel would re-blossom a desolate desert land and produce abundant food, fruit, and foliage. But look at 37.10. Here's the last thing. Trust the God who can do this. Ezekiel 37.10. God says the nation of Israel is going to crawl out of their graves, they're going to look like skeletons, and they're going to be just nothing. But they're going to become this. 37.10. So I prophesied as he commanded to me, and breath came into them, and they lived and they stood up in their feet, an exceeding great army. Let me ask you this. Did the atomic scientists and the military weapons engineers and the businessmen that listened to them and wanted to fulfill Ezekiel, do you think that, that all of the scientists that, that are so advanced, that are Israeli scientists developed the neutron bomb, Israeli scientists developed the atomic bomb, Israeli scientists are at the forefront of technology, your cell phone you have in your hand was developed uh, at a Motorola facility by a Jewish scientist. Most all of the Nobel Prizes, the majority of them have been won by Jewish scientists. Do you think that they're doing that because they read Ezekiel? No. They were trying to protect themselves, defend themselves, and make a living, but in the process, they became the third or fourth most powerful military in the world when atomic weaponry is factored in, and God was watching over his word to fulfill it. I only told you all this to say this. Everything I told you is impossible to cause to happen, humanly. To take a nation that's been desolate for 2,600 years, put them back into the land that you said they would go in, have them rename every city like in the Bible, to have that desert turn into a rose, and for them to become an exceeding great army in one generation is physically, humanly impossible. God says, I'm going to do this so you would trust the God who watches over his word to perform it. Now, I want you to turn to one verse. Go to the New Testament, Luke 21. Because I never study prophecy without getting you to the punchline. When Jesus preached about prophecy, he always concluded with a challenge. And that's what I'm going to conclude with for you this morning. Jesus goes through and briefly, starting in in Luke 21, verse 29, Jesus explains the entire end of the world. And when he gets all done describing it, he pauses and concludes with two commands. So Jesus didn't tell prophecy to sell books. He didn't do prophecy for people to get all edgy and scared. He taught on prophecy for two spiritual reasons. Number one, look look at verse 36. Jesus gives two imperatives or commands for us who listen to him. And we can learn what Jesus said were our responsibilities as believers. Jesus said this, verse 36, watch therefore. The first thing he said is, he commands us. Hey, I told you all this stuff. I told you what the world looks like when I return. When you see these things begin to happen, know that it's getting close. Okay? First command, you should know enough prophecy to know if the things Jesus described in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, if they start happening, it should put your antennas up. When, when you know that Iran's going to attack Israel and Iran's in the news and God says Jerusalem is going to be the center of all the conflict and Iran says we're going we're to annihilate all the Jews and get them out of Jerusalem, your antenna should be going, Woo, this sounds biblical. So watch, but look at this. And pray always. This word pray in Luke twenty one thirty six is there are seven different Greek words for prayer in the New Testament. This word is a fascinating word. You know what the word is? It means to beg. 
It means to earnestly plead for something. Do you know what Jesus said prophecy should do to us? Number one, it should make us watch and realize, kind of like our, our fellow Americans learned in Houston, that nothing is very lasting. I mean, a little air and a little water can destroy everything and, and mess everything up, like just happened in Hurricane Ike. Like they found out in L.A., the freighter and the commuter train crashing. I mean, your whole world can just end just like that. Everything is very fragile. Prophecy should remind us of that. But the second thing is we should pray always. Jesus revealed that all the, the things that people were trusting in, that they would never last. Jesus' prophecies were always about the fact that the world doesn't last. But what he says is, I want you to be working towards something that will never end. And he said, you should be begging me to, to be involved in your life, praying always to be involved in what will never go away. Now, this is what I want to leave you with. Forget all the Israel-Russia stuff. You're going to read that in the newspaper. Let me tell you something that's not in the newspaper. Here's the rest of the story, okay? I ask you, what are you intensely, look at verse 36, what are you praying, begging, beseeching, intensely asking God to be doing through your life that will last forever? You say, wait a minute, I'm just trying to get through school. I mean, I'm just trying to make it through my job. I can hardly afford gas. You know, it went up. We left and it was like 369. What is it, 419 this morning? I mean, it's just getting hard to even drive anywhere. And that's what we kind of get bogged down in. God says, hey, look beyond all that. What are you begging me to do through your life that will last forever? Gas will come and go. Your car will wear out. What are you doing that will never end? Christ here said something that anyone in the family of God can do. Here's what you do. Jesus said, do what I love and make your investments in the areas that last forever. What are they? I'll just list these and you can think about them. Jesus said this in Revelation 5.8, I collect all of your prayers. So you know what I, when I read Revelation 5, 8, do you know what that makes me want to do? If Jesus collects all my prayers, what do you think we should do? Pray. Did you catch that? We're supposed to pray without what? Do you know the amount of prayer that you offer shows how much you think you're sufficient or how much you think God is sufficient? Little prayer means I can do it all, I don't need God. Much prayer means I can't do anything and I need the Lord. And so you can determine your, your level of self-sufficiency or God dependence by your prayer. And, and Paul said, I have to pray without ceasing. Jesus couldn't start his day without getting up really early and starting it in prayer. The reformers used to say they had to spend two or three hours in their day praying before they started. You know what we go? Two or three hours. Are you kidding? I get that done in two or three minutes. Do you know what that shows? We think we accomplish it all ourselves. Jesus struggled in prayer saying, Lord, not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Number one, Jesus said, I collect all your prayers. We should pray. In Mark 12, 42, Jesus said, I multiply sacrificial gifts. Remember the widow that threw in her two mites? Do you know what God measures? Not the amount of your gift, how much it costs you. Do you know what really matters to God? Not whether you give a dollar or a $27,000. Do you know what matters? How much it hurt for you to give it. How much it cost you personally to give it. And he says, what I measure is the sacrificial nature of your investment. It's hard to slow down and give time. It's hard out of our resources to give. Jesus said, I multiply eternally sacrificial gifts. Here's another one. Thirdly, the Lord says in Daniel 12, 3, those that turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever. God says, I count those that you lead to me. The only thing I and you can take with us to heaven are people. You can't take anything else but people. You can actually take people with you to heaven. You can actually, like, like I just did, I was talking to this Iraqi vet, it was in Denver, uh, I don't remember, about 24 hours ago, and this guy survived several tours, and he was bragging about it. He was our waiter, and I looked right at him, and I said, if an IED had been right under you, walked over, and it blew you to kingdom come, where would you have awakened? Boy, did that stop him in his tracks. He just looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, if you died, where would you be? He says, well, I'm a good Catholic. I said, really? I said, I'm a bad Catholic, okay? Uh, I said, uh, Catholic, you're talking about in the Bible, the Catholic Church, the Holy Catholic Church? I said, yeah. I said, I understand that. I'm Catholic. I said, but I'm not a Roman Catholic. 
Boy, now he put his pad down. He says, what exactly are you? I said, I said, I am a sinner just like you are. And apart from Christ, I have no hope. And I said, and you don't have hope either. And I said, have you ever studied the Bible? And he said, no. And I pulled out my bullet for the week, my track that I keep in my wallet. And I said, have you ever studied the Bible? He said, no. I said, here. And I opened up, showed him the verses. And I said, you all alone sometime, before you forget this, need to find out where your sins are. If they're on you, you're going to perish forever in hell. If they're on Christ, you have eternal life. That was more than he could process. He said, I'll read it. Jesus said, you can take people with you to heaven. Some of us sow some water, others bring forth and watch them reaping. Number one, I collect your prayers, pray. I multiply gifts, give. I collect souls, you win to me, win them. Jesus said, I remember humble service, serve. I love those who go for me, go. To obey Jesus, we have to watch and pray. I don't know when Iran's going to attack Israel. I know it's going to be an amazing event. But I do know this. God wants me to be praying, giving, and taking people with me to heaven. What are you begging God to do in your life today that will last forever? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you that your word clearly tells us the future. And we don't set dates. And we don't know when it's going to happen, but we do know it's going to happen because you said it and we trust you. But the purpose of prophecy is not to get us sitting on the border watching for Iranian tanks. It's for us to be praying because you collect our prayers. It's for us to be giving because you multiply sacrificial gifts. And it's for us to be talking to people about Jesus, you whom we love. And I pray that among those standing right here that some of your saints will decide this morning that they are going to start begging you for things. Begging you for a passion for your word, for a passion for sharing the gospel, for a passion for investing in eternity. And I pray that our belief of your word through prophecy would stir our hearts to serve you more. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. See you soon.